to maybe move this to slightly more tangible stuff, um, I think we quoted Tony Hurst really briefly in our piece, and we could have probably written a lot more because I think you know the cult of Tony is. I almost I don't know about you, but Tony Hurst is almost like a code word I drop with people when I meet them at events and stuff. And I'll mention his name, and if their face lights up with recognition, then I think, okay, they're they're cool. <laughs> and if uh, if they have no idea who he is, you know, I'll try to explain it. And if they get it immediately, then there might be some hope. And then and then the, you know, then there's the rest of them. And and what I love about what Tony does is I think he embodies a certain spirit of the data artist and a guy who thinks very deeply, but also you know the stuff he worked with when I first became familiar with them was technology that was so accessible to the rest of us. You didn't need a massive, you know, data array lab and racks and racks of, you know, hard equipment and access to computer scientists and AI people to do what he was doing. He was using tools like Yahoo Pipes and Google Spreadsheets and stuff like that. Um, and so, but he's, he's gotten remarkably depressed on his blog lately. And there was something he wrote and it was actually, like, did we actually have a section in our piece called Innovation Lost? Yeah. So he had an art. He independently came up with a piece called Innovation Lost. And I'll just read a couple lines from it. Uh, he said, We used to build things around Amazon's API and Yahoo's API and Google's APIs and Twitter's API. And as those companies innovated, they built bare bones services that they let others play with. And the upstarts let us play with their toys. And we did because they were easy to play with. But they're not anymore. Now they're not something you can play with. The toys became enterprise wares, and now you need professional tools to play with them. And that kind of aligns, he didn't even talk about RSS in that post. I think he does in another one. Uh, uh, it, it does kind of define how the kind of the shift and the playground has shifted. And I remember when I was probably most enthusiastic and most uh, feeling creative in terms of DIY innovation, it was when you could play with the RSS feed off a tool like Delicious or Flickr. And with next to no understanding how underlying code worked, you could hack this stuff together. And as Tony noted, you know, that kind of accessible framework for tinkering, you have to dig deeper anyway, if it exists. Yeah, I mean, I, Tony, I think is right on. And I think the, the question that I've been struggling with a little bit, and I've been following some of the work of Kin Lane, who reminds me a lot of, of Tony, as does John Udell, who I'll talk about in a second. But Ken Lane's been talking about, you know, APIs at their best provide a kind of more robust um, level of grabbing information from a variety of services. But I think what Tony is alluding to, which I think should give us some pause around the API move, is the corporations who are running those services control them entirely. Right, so there's no vision for open standards. There's no vision for what's being shared um, and open formats. And so I think the API question mark is while a lot of people are going in there, there is a huge, huge issue with how do we build aggregated syndicated models around APIs that we can't guarantee that will be around. I mean, that's the thing that people are running into with Google Docs or Google Spreadsheets right now. You know, Google, without offering a new API, is changing the whole format with which they share their spreadsheet stuff on. And that's screwing up a lot of these really kind of database-less um, applications that Tony was doing four or five years ago, like you know. And so I think there's a, a big question, and I think his depression, I think if he's depressed, it's just a good sign that we're all going to be depressed in four or five years. <laughs> he's usually had that one. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I think that's kind of like, you know, you know the canary in the coal mine. But I also I I do take some um, I do take some uh, hope or how would I say I'm I am a bit excited um, to hear John Udell talk about this notion of the trailing edge technologies and I think he's far more um, optimistic whether rightly or wrongly that the work that was happening uh, ten or fifteen years ago with these open formats. Um, are going to return and the the web itself is going to kind of reemerge as a space where people feel the freedom um, to grab RSS or to build open source tools and that, you know, it's not going to be simply about which big service do I open up my data to. And I think domain of one's own, rightly or wrongly, in terms of UMW, is kind of hitching its vision to that star, right? It's hoping that, you know, these trailing edge technologies and by giving each student and faculty their own space 
to imagine and build in that they're going to actually not only learn something about the web and learn something about these platforms and the applications, but they're actually going to see the unbelievable value in owning a certain amount of their data and being able, if Google or Twitter or Flickr doesn't allow you to do certain things, it's not going to stop you from doing them. And it's not going to stop you from understanding exactly what it is they're doing to stop you from doing what you want to do. And I think in some ways for me, um, that notion of the user innovation toolkit that uh, Udell returns to when he's talking about these trailing edge technologies, right? Like, you know, web hosting hasn't, it's not new. RSS is not new, right? A lot of these things that we're kind of talking about is still radical. They've been around for more than a decade. And, you know, commodity web hosting it was affordable in 2003. The fact that no university really took it on as a teaching and learning mission is kind of, it's mind boggling when you think about it. And I think his idea of giving every student, faculty, and staff member um, this user innovation toolkit in which they kind of can come into a, a deeper understanding of the web and a deeper understanding of what kind of defined higher ed culture in relationship to the web in the mid and early 90s as a kind of return, in some ways, to a moment of innovation. And not to a golden age of innovation. I'm not pretending that, because, you know, higher ed didn't make it easy. And GeoCities emerged because they did make it easy. And I just hope that higher ed learns from some of its own mistakes, but also some of its own great discoveries. And kind of returns to this kind of position of um, empowerment for its constituents. And actually understands its role as kind of enabling and making possible innovations that move beyond a vendor-driven relationship and move beyond the kind of simple idea that, hey, I don't have to think about the technology, so this is a win-win. I mean, I think it's time for us to kind of return, and I think the depression maybe Tony feels, and I don't want to speak for Tony, is that very few people other than him even really realize it. And that's a basic problem of literacy. And so it's fascinating to me that maybe some of the things and some of the moves we make might be not so much around the technology, per se, but around the literacy of that technology. And uh, I think that's the direction I'm interested in going more and more, which will get us out of the kind of you know, notion of the field as here's the next tool. Right here's the next that Gizmodo's change, like what a Animoto clothes, but here's Geomoto or Gaga Moto or Godzilla Moto. It's like that tool chasing, that churnware is uh, is a dead end. And I think we all kind of realized that after the last decade. Yeah, there's it, it kind of circles back to what we were talking about earlier, where I was kind of. Is struggling with how do we begin to engage more and more of the university community to realize that these issues are important and listening to you talk kind of reminded me you know as, as if we can pull more people onto the open web in one way or another and get them to kind of see this as their space too then hopefully some of these problems start to be seen as their problems too i do i think that idea of some kind of a a shared sense of responsibility in this space and you brought out the point in the in the article, and this might be a kind of good note to end on, is you brought out the Tim Berners-Lee stuff, he invented the web 25 years ago, and the point you made that I thought was so brilliant, and I think it was a really nice kind of capstone uh, to the discussion was, you know, the web is an artificial creation, right? Like democracy, like write the constitution. It's like, it only is as great as our involvement in it. And I think this idea of us offloading any notion of, um, of kind of involvement, and that goes not just for the web. It goes for all points of our culture where we're falling down um, as a kind of, you know, informed, organized uh, community um, is an issue. And it's an issue that I don't know if that's ed tech's flag to bear, right? I don't know if that's our burden. That's our cross. But damn it, somebody's got to do it. And if it starts in ed tech, all the better, right? I can actually wake up and be happy about the job I do. Well, I, I think it would be, I think it would be typically self-aggrandizing to both of us to think that this is our mission. But uh, it's got to be everybody's, and uh, I guess that includes us, right? I guess we're included with everybody, hopefully.
Yeah. Well, on our good days. 